briefly, maybe in about five minutes, try to explain to you the meaning and the logic of the term uh, global fault lines. We started to use uh, probably for the last two years uh, in various places. Uh, and after that, I will pass it to Vasilis. He will uh, show you an example of how global fault lines is a framework can be used in understanding uh, major global issues and events around the Greek Euro crisis. Uh, he applies this term uh, in his latest book to, to Greek crisis in the European Union. Yeah. Uh, we use the term global fault lines in the sense of a unique approach to global affairs, uh, which uses the geo geological metaphor of tectonic plates. So this is the beginning of this term. When we were thinking of what kind of term, what kind of terminology will help us, we were uh, we started thinking about uh, the geological uh, tectonic plates and the movements of the uh, tectonic plates. And this was the beginning of this term. And also, originally, we were inspired by André Gundar Frank, especially his post-Marxist works, uh, in particular, his Reorient. Uh, he described the, a kind of a framework in his book without naming it. Uh, so we found the name Global Fault Lines, but most of the elements we used in explaining Global Fault Lines, uh, uh, maybe in a very beginner's level uh, explained by Andre Gundar Frank in that book, but he unfortunately didn't have time and he died soon after. Uh, before developing uh, those terms and, uh, and establishing a framework, which we, th we think we are trying to do now uh, from the point where he left. So by this uh, way, we are trying to sketch out and analyze various fault lines in the global politics, which mark the points at which the tectonic plates collide and crumble. And when they collide and crumble, the, the various crises emerge here and there in the world, in the global affairs. In global and regional fault lines, uh, uh, these fault lines in the global and regional affairs are constantly interacting and constantly producing <coughs> and reproducing equilibrium and disequilibrium and defining periods of relative peace and, uh, and also periods of crisis, war, uh, and serious uh, socioeconomic upheavals, as uh, we are currently witnessing in various parts of the earth, uh, like Eurozone crisis, like uh, so-called Arab Spring events, and, and other uh, specific events, both economic and political as well. Uh, so the current phase uh, of globalization, which we call as financialization, uh, is extremely complicated, and uh, this phase in one way or another connects every part of the earth. So never in history the, the earth and the events in happening on this global arena uh, has been this uh, closely interconnected. And that is one of the reasons why we think this term explains the current complications uh, and the change and the shift better than any other uh, framework uh, uh, the political scientists uh, or his historians uh, use. Uh, global fault lines is behind the disintegrative tendencies of the US-led hub and spoke neo-imperial system or Euro-Atlantic uh, global hegemonic uh, system uh, and the power shift to the uh, global east, global south. Uh, and these two uh, tendencies uh, to us are the most important features of the international politics uh, probably since the Second World War. So the disintegrative uh, tendencies of the US-led hub and spoke uh, system and uh, uh, the global power shift uh, to the uh, south and, uh, and the east. So within this wider historical uh, context uh, of global fault lines, the interdependence and conflictual relationship of contending, po contending forces provide the social and political struggle and change as well. <clears throat> so in this sense, Global Fault Lines provides a convenient framework uh, within which it is possible to understand where agency is more likely to be successful and where not. 
So this is particularly relevant by looking at the, uh, the so-called Arab Spring events, uh, but also as well as the, the, the Euro-Mediterranean uh, zone as well, what's happening in Greece, in, in Ireland, in Spain, in Portugal. So and around this uh, this term uh, and within the framework provided by this term, we try to analyze various events. Uh, in our uh, two books, we looked at uh, various events from the uh, the first Gulf War uh, to the uh, to the still ongoing uh, military conflict in Afghanistan, uh, to the oil conflict, uh, and to the uh, to the energy security issues. And in his recent book, Ovasilis is looking at the, uh, the eurozone crisis and Greece in particular, again using the uh, same uh, framework. So, and all these are based on uh, our analysis of the global affairs, which uh, is determined by these two tendencies. One, the decline of the current core, Euro-Atlantic core, and the emergence of uh, the new challenge from uh, the global south, uh, global east. Uh, so in this sense, we believe the 21st century uh, looks set to be fashioned by uh, the rise of China, India, Brazil, and other emerging powers uh, at the state level, and the formidable rise of Pacific Asia as the most significant economic zone uh, at the regional level. And all this, uh, we believe, uh, uh, are bringing irreversible geopolitical consequences, some of which are already visible. Uh, we are not saying that it is all over for the uh, uh, for the US-centered uh, uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, core. Uh, the United States and, uh, and uh, its uh, allied countries are still uh, the strongest uh, countries in the world. Uh, but the reality is that uh, the US economy and the US-centered Western economies are fast losing ground uh, by all indications. And instead, China, India, Brazil, Russia, and other emerging powers have been strengthening uh, considerably. And this relationship uh, between these two tendencies uh, is underlying the current situation. Uh, this, uh, and this is what we call a historical shift. Uh, and as a result of this, the unipolar phase of uh, US-dominated uh, uh, core is being replaced, currently being replaced by a multipolar phase in which the United States will still continue to remain one of the most prominent powers, uh, but has to share this position <coughs> with China and India uh, and the other uh, major emerging economies, uh, fast rising, uh, growing powers. Uh, so uh, to conclude this introductory section, Global fault lines, we describe this as a framework. It's not an alternative perspective. It's not an alternative ideology. Uh, but it's a framework. It's a holistic framework to incorporate a large number of uh, global shifts, global movements, um, and points of crisis happening uh, in the uh, global politics at the same time in the 21st century. <coughs> Thank you, Bule. I'll start from where when uh, uh, stopped, which is the, the concept of fault lines and global fault lines is a holistic framework of analysis uh, to understand the social, social realities. Um, and I would add straight away that it is an interdisciplinary framework of analysis, not just uh, a political economy framework or a um, um, geography framework, geographical framework, or political science framework, or anything like that. It's interdisciplinary. Broadly speaking, it's a social scientific framework of analysis. And it is useful because global fault lines uh, brings into the discourse of, uh, of, uh, of, you know, I would say progressive social science discourse, critical discourses, the concept of geopolitics, which has been appropriated traditionally by right-wing intellectuals. 
uh, geopolitics has been used, uh, major geopoliticians theories have been used by Hitler, um, I forgot how Schofer was one of them. Uh, and it gives us the opportunity to, to relaunch, um, 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 or actually to, let me rephrase, to, 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 to snatch away from uh, right-wing discourses, philosophical discourses, the concept of geopolitics and geostrategy, and bring it into a, uh, a progressive analytical framework, which on top of all this is not Eurocentric. It's truly global. Uh, and I think it is very, very significant. Now, at the different level of analysis, um, if you want me to give you an example of global fault lines today, at least the way in, in which they, they, they've been in operation since, since the collapse of the Bretton Woods system in 1971, which is the, uh, the time when uh, you know, credit was unleashed because the cold the cold window, as one of uh, uh, Joanne Gower put it, is uh, you know uh, closed. So the uh, the gold uh, dollar convertibility finished. So credit was free, and therefore people could move money around. So speculators, you know, can appear and like Soros, and by moving money around, they can make money out of money. Uh, what Marx used to call money begetting money, right? So. Uh, um, this is the, the era in which financialization started, which others in the 90s called globalization. We prefer the term financialization for the simple reason because manufacturing and real economic indicators have started moving, shifting to uh, places like India, China, Southeast Asia, uh, South Africa, Brazil, and other parts. And this is an indicator of global shift of shifting because at the end of the day is the production of real economic values, of real commodities that matter. So this has shifted <laughs> to the east, to the global east as we call it, or global south if you prefer. And what, it's, it's, it, it, what, what uh, it's, it prevailed in the west it was financial services, financialization. So this is already the global fault line, okay, if you can, if you see well. Um, now, how there are more. I can go on, uh, you know, because it's like if you want to use, a, you know, kind of uh, visualize this concept is, you know, if you think of the think uh, think of the uh, Olympic Games logo in a transmogrified way, okay? The Olympic, like, you know, but in a very messy way, not nicely as they are put together by the designers. Um, um, now. How you, I mean, the, 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 proof of the proof of the pudding, as they say, is in the eating. So if you want to implement this, because apply this concept into real empirical stuff, history, how, how can it be done? Um, we, we, I myself have uh, has been fascinated by, been fascinated by the Greek crisis and the Eurozone crisis. And so let's, you know, try to see how this can be used. Um, having always in mind that geopolitics is an important factor um, in, in any form of, uh, of analysis. Um, so, and I, we have a historical point of departure, which was the creation, the foundation of the modern Greek state. Uh, now, if you pause for a second and look at the map there, um, see, this state here, Right. No, forget about this. This came back. This is where attached to it. These states here. This was the Greeks, the, the first Greek state, 1830. Um, now, this part of the world. Presumably, all these people here. What, what kind of revolution was that against the Ottoman Turks? Was it the bourgeois revolution? Was it what was it? Um, it was none of this, and believe it, believe it or not, there are historians and political economists that argue that this revolution was driven by, by uh, industrial or robust industrial bourgeoisie, as if as if as if this there were, there were German uh, Junkers or Junkers, which they drove the process of unification of Germany, or as if this was Piedmont, like in Italy, which unified Italy under the the drive of of, uh, of an industrial. Uh, sector with first type, you know, accumulation of capital, the, the full monte, as they, as described in, in, in by Marx, 
Now, this was not the case in this part of the world. What was happening here was that Britain and France wanted to create a little state here to control it in order to deter and block the Russian fleets coming down from the Mediterranean. And also, at the same time, from Egypt, there were some kind of uh, movement uh, from, uh, uh, I forgot the name of uh, this, uh, this ruler of Egypt at the time, again, who wanted to, who invaded the Peloponnese and so on. And the Western powers, imperial powers already at the time, they wanted to have a, a, a Christian state to control there and, um, and to facilitate their operations and trade in the region. So in other words, Greece was an artificial geopolitical dis uh, construction. You know, if at all, any Greek bourgeoisie existed here in Constantinople, in Smyrna, in Alexandria, in other parts of uh, around the, uh, the areas here, merchant classes, financial classes. It was not here at all, nothing, it was nothing. It was just, just peasants, peasants. And the intellectuals in the West, in, in Vienna, in, Par in Paris, and other parts of Europe, that were nationalist intellectuals influenced by the Enlightenment. Now, how does this connect to the debt problem of Greece? Because we, we wrote a book which is called Greece Financialization and, and the European Union, the Political Economy of Debt and Disruption. It's very simple how it connects to the debt problem. Because during the War of Independence, Greece borrowed massive amounts of money. Not Greece, Greece didn't exist. The elites that were conducting the operation against us, they borrowed money to conduct the war against the Ottoman Turks. Uh, and, that, and they defaulted because they could not pay back uh, their thing. And they mortgaged the land. They more the future land. So basically they sold out the independence even before they became independent, which is a form of uh, collateralized debt obligation, the former CDOs. It did, the Greeks invented it against fighting against the Turks at the time. Uh, look at this. 84, uh, 24, 25, the first bankruptcy of the Greek state. You can see that the Greek state has been insolvent for over a century. It's always been insolvent. It's always been on default. So who kept this country going? No industrial bourgeoisie, no production, real material production, could not recycle um, uh, the surpluses within Greece to create a proper state like Germany did, like, like Britain, like Italy, before they became imperial powers and export capital. Because that's a, the classic meaning of imperialism, out of which Lenin and Bukharin explain in their work, you know, like the over-accumulation of capital, you need to to, to export capital abroad, and that's the, uh, how we understand imperialism, at least in the first part, uh, the, during the First World War. And this is Greece. And so therefore, we have a dependent subaltern state, but the, the, the sources of the debt are rather geopolitical than purely economic. Of course, they come down at the end of money. But you see, where is the fault line here? The fault line is that Greece has a geopolitical uh, surplus value, as it was perceived by the West. They want to set up a state. The state does not qualify as a state, yeah, because it doesn't have the economic assets available and the level of capital accumulation required to sustain a state, a bourgeois state. So therefore, uh, that's a fault line. The fault line uh, which lies between a, an underdeveloped economic structure and a geopolitical surplus, surplus value, so to speak, although the term is a bit, uh, a bit tricky. I, I, I don't find a better one. I don't use it in the book, by the way. So that's how it all started. And this fault line kept reproducing itself over the decades, again and again and again and again. So any time the Greek elites wanted to achieve something, they, they ran out of money, they wanted a loan to the West, they were going to the West, the Western powers, they were asking for money. And the, 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 uh, the uh, Western Europe, European powers or the American empire said, we need a base somewhere in Crete. Or sort out the Cyprus issue to give you money. This, were, this is real. Um, this is, we document this in the book historically. So, you know, so... Uh, so the story goes, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, at the same time, the Greek elites were, of course, aware that there is a problem catching up with the West. There's always they wanted to catch up with the West. Catching up. Catching up was a major problem. There is always, and they never managed to catch up with the West. They never managed to solve their balance of payment problems. Never. It's always been uh, insolvent. I mean, there were some invisible earnings uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, which kind of counterbalanced the 
balance of payment problem, and overall, they were not enough to uh, to keep the the country solvent. Um, so the country had a permanent debt problem. When we come to uh, um, so industry, uh, the Greek industrial sector never managed to compete on an equal footing with with Western with Western industry, um, and. Since the Greek industry was underdeveloped, there were there were a, a number of consequences. One consequence was that the state was big to absorb the surplus labor, I mean, because otherwise you would have had massive unemployment forever. So the state acted as a as an employer of last resort. So you had a huge public sector in Greece relative to to population, and. Um, um, and then, of course, the use of clientelistic and so on. Uh, and then, because of all this, and then you had also a fiscal problem, a permanent fiscal problem, you know, through budgetary crisis and so on. So Greece had a type of twin deficits, one which was external, of external origin, balanced payment, and of domestic origin, which had to do with a, um, with, with a fiscal problem it had. You know, the, the revenue could not match the, uh, uh, the expenditure. Uh, permanently for, 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 you know, throughout its, uh, its history, its modern history. Um, now, looking into more specifically into post-45 mm. history, uh, it's interesting to see that when Western Europe was undergoing the so-called period of economic miracles, the 50s and 60s, under a program of let's call it Keynesian, welfare state, high wages, poor days, mass production for mass consumption, you know, and so on. I mean, uh, public utilities, there were, well, public utilities were public utilities, were under the state. I mean, Greece experienced none of this, you know.